All right. Welcome to Make with Sam. This is our graphic design with Photoshop class. And we are about to get started here. So basically I got a little small agenda for the hour long video here. Um, we're gonna start with who, who am I? And then a little bit of history of Photoshop and the first Photoshop image. Um, and then we're also gonna go into the top 10 tools. It's gonna be like the bulk, I would say, of this hour long <coughs> session probably about 30 minutes of that is going to be really talking about just some of the main tools and then beyond that we're going to go to um, a little project I would say how we get started with formatting a particular document um, how to create something and then how to save it how to export it out to where it could be printed in a variety of ways and then the last thing um, is just a little Q&A um, if if we have any questions that is but then um, beyond that, just some resources that'll pop up on the screen. I'll show you guys some of my portfolio, just a little bit at the end, and then you can go kind of explore that on your own. So let's get to it. Who is Sam? It's me. <laughs> so basically, yeah, I'm an artist, uh, an entrepreneur, um, an instructor, obviously, and then a maker, I would say generally, I like to make all kinds of stuff. So that is kind of my main thing. Um, graduated in 2012 from Seattle um, Art Institute, though I, at one point, I'm now in Minnesota, but I at one point um, lived in Seattle, Washington for a while, and basically just moved back to Minnesota not too long ago, but I graduated out there with a bachelor's degree. Um, and then at one point while I was out there, I also worked for Microsoft, so Microsoft Store. So some of my instructing capabilities and abilities uh, basically showed up in that time period. So between 2011, 2015 was the time that I worked at Microsoft and I learned a lot of stuff. I would say a lot of computer stuff, <laughs> a lot of good stuff. And uh, beyond that, I have a pretty decent background, I would say in 2D design, 3D design. Um, and then a good amount of years in 3D printing as well, which is not related to this class, but if you watch any of my other classes, you'll know what I'm talking about. Alrighty, so let's get to history and more, as I called it, this little mini segment here. Basically, um, we're going to talk a little bit about Photoshop, and this particular image, which I actually had to look up. I did not even know this before the, the class. I'm not going to lie to you. But basically, um, Jennifer in Paradise was a picture that one of the original programmers of Photoshop used. They kind of just scanned it in and brought it into the program and manipulated it and did different things with it. So it's kind of a cool, I guess, um, throwback, if you will, to Photoshop's, I guess, first image, which is, it wasn't really Photoshop, at least say maybe we could Photoshop it here today or do something with it. But ultimately, this was just the original image that had been scanned in and used as a test sample for how the program could work, how it could change maybe formats, how it could um, do a lot of different things that Photoshop can do. So it is a pretty basic image, I guess. It was like, this is who we actually got married to at the end of the day. But the story behind it is really just that he used it as a sample image. And in the earlier iterations of Photoshop, you could maybe find this. Though personally, I don't remember this image when I was young starting to use Photoshop. But um, at the end of the day, like, this is the original image. So some other cool images that I found, this is like, I mean, just a super small sample selection of what Photoshop can do and is capable of from this top left image here, kind of showing um, just some retouching of photos from magazine purposes maybe, or modeling or whatever. Um, the one below it with the, looks like I guess it would be a guy with a globe on his head that looks like mirror-like. Um, just different types of things to so the star troopers or storm troopers on the cats to this cool like, wolf sheep type of um i guess how could you put it a double exposure and then this kind of world that's kind of been like slanted on an edge almost like some flat earth type craziness um so um there are a lot of 
different things that you can do, I would say, with Photoshop. It just really depends on what you're trying to do and what you're after. Um, it's a very vast and like almost infinite use type program, as much as almost all programs in the computer are. It just depends on how you think about using them. They're always just a tool. So next is actually a group of images that I created created um, and I use Photoshop for and a combination of other programs too but this top image here the top I guess right it says the COVID Chronicles it's actually a image that I made for an album that I'm working on I'm actually a music artist as well and I create my own album art through Photoshop <laughs> and other programs too but Photoshop's the main one I use but then just to the left of that is this like snail looking thing on a t-shirt so I also make t-shirts I do a lot of different stuff but ultimately I'm just showing you guys a sample of like how I use it the image below is a picture I took um, when I was on the airplane flying into Seattle like coming from a visit from Minnesota or more than likely um, but it was like landing um, situation where we were coming down and I was able to capture the Space Needle and the kind of what is that I guess north downtown area like of that particular state city so yeah pretty cool stuff that I've made and then some of my little sample things on the left hand side for signage and a game box and a couple different things so I don't want to spend too much time on that particular part but let's get to it so um, the basics so if you don't know that Photoshop is a pixel based or pixel manipulation type tool um, that is what it is so if you don't know what a pixel is that's where we're starting we're starting from I guess the basics of how you view the images on the computer because that is ultimately what a pixel is is a picture element and it is uh, the smallest unit of a digital picture usually square but not always we're going to see some examples of that and how monitors can translate that but then um and by monitor i mean like the screen that you look through and then one solid color so when you really zoom in on the picture it's all these little blocks so here's the example of the little blocks i would say it's not maybe the newest looking picture in the world but it ultimately shows and represents that the pixel is each individual cell or element of the screen. Um, and when you create pixel images, you can, I guess in Photoshop, you can manipulate them. But then another, I guess, uh, image here is basically the density. So back in the day, um, there was not as much resolution, I would say, in the screens and the amount of um, visual information that could be put into the screen. So back in the day, it's almost like to the far left here would be the older monitor and as you go to the far right it would be like upgrading in technology meaning the screen's getting crisper everything's getting sharper and more detailed um, so that's ultimately what's going on with the monitor technology and TVs and all those other different things but then when you look at this this is actually showing how the shapes work they're not always square as that first image showed or the first information I showed about what is a pixel where it said it's a square image and actually in this case it could be rectangular really close together spread apart kind of ob long shapes is XO one LCD it's got a kind of weird shapes so just through time they've made different types of displays and they will display things in different ways so things might not be the same shape Per these different monitors when you actually look at the full image um, things might be a little skewed per the monitor um, those are details that most people don't notice but just know that that's kind of how it's working and Photoshop is a tool that can manipulate the pixels directly so let's get into it so the top 10 tools in Photoshop um, are going to be these there's going to be a um, some of them that we use kind of almost in tandem they almost work together depending on what you're doing um, they all could be used i guess independently and i'm going to show them as independent as i can but i'll show you how they can be worked together as well so we might pop back to this screen just so we kind of reference where we're at or where we're going but i do have it on a piece of paper here so all we have to really do is is um, just keep going through them once we hit photoshop which we're about to hit right now so 
we are in Photoshop and some of these little things that you see on the screen here, I'm going to take that off once we really get into it so you can see the full screen. Um, but basically in the beginning, whether you're using an older version of Photoshop or a brand new one, one of the Creative Cloud ones, there are going to be some differences in some of the tools. The things that I'm talking about are ultimately going to work the same. They might have updated or changed how that tool works a little bit, but ultimately it's going to work the same way. So the main thing is just kind of understanding what each tool is for, um, which I'm going to try to do my best to explain here. So the first thing, I guess, that was on that list, if I just pop back really quick, it was just selections. And selections, if we were to go back here, and I'm just gonna turn my face off now moving forward, um, is basically going to be a way to grab the pixel. So first thing we need is an image. So I'm gonna drag an image on the screen here from a recent photo shoot that I did from my garden. So. This is from my DSLR camera. It could be a picture from anything though. That's the cool thing is Photoshop doesn't really discriminate on what the content is or if it has to be from a camera or anything like that. It's just more of having a digital image. And in this case, it's a marigold, which is some flowers that I'm growing at my grandma's house. So selections are going to allow us to manipulate this image in a certain way and control it, and control how we manipulate it. So if we're looking up here, um, my cursor's up here on the top left here, basically we have a toolbar and the first few, or first um, almost the four, are actually selection tools. So one is just a basic selection. It's gonna click on things. It's gonna allow you to literally select something um, versus this next one is a lasso. So think about like a cowboy. It can throw a rope around something and catch it. That's kind of what the lasso selection tool does. So in its basic shape, it's a circle um, or elliptical, depending on if you keep it perfect or not. But then there is also, if you left click, hold, and then you can look at the different options. So elliptical marquee is what it's truly called. But then we have our rectangular, we have a single row, a single column. Sometimes you wanna select that very fine edge. That's gonna give you a one pixel selection, a, literally a one pixel selection that you could, whatever purpose you could do something with. But then in the case of rectangular and elliptical, they're more practical use. Um, Let's say if I wanted just to capture this little piece here and then for whatever, do some adjustments on it. This is the way that you could select in a shape form versus this, whoops, sorry about that. This next one is a polygon or polygonal lasso or the lasso selection, which is more like a free draw or the lasso. I'm just left click holding and I'm dragging until I complete that selection. And then now I have um, a little bit different type of selection. And let me make sure I actually close the loop. There it is. So if you don't close the loop, it kind of shows it a little bit different than what we're seeing now on these, what you would call marching ants is, is what I think they've called that in the past. But the polygonal version of it allows you to click. So I clicked once, now I can click and I can create a selection. Sometimes you might need to double click. So that was actually a mistake on my end. I didn't close it the right way. So I always think about this like you're putting a fence around your, your subject, whatever you're trying to capture in that selection. At the very end, it actually shows you a, and I'll show it one more time, it actually, shows you a different icon. So before we get there, there's kind of the lasso poly polygonal shape icon. And then when I get very close to the other edge, it's a circle, which means complete. So it's going to complete that particular selection, allowing you to do the adjustments or whatever, which we're gonna move on to next. Um, so, well, actually we have one more tool. So this one's gonna be the most magical of them all. Um, it does take time to get used to using it, but it's called the magic wand. 
and it does have some tools up here at the top and each one of these does each one of these particular selection tools is going to have a refine edge it's going to have a few other options we're just talking about the high level versions of these for this particular purpose so the Mag magic wand and then there's a quick selection tool so the quick selection tool is interesting because it allows you to drag and it just adds to that selection as you go so this one might be good for this flower it might make it a bit quicker to select the differences in the red so we grabbed a little bit too much here but now same tool if you hold alt and then drag with your left click, it's going to actually do the opposite. So instead of adding to the selection, it's gonna take away, but it's gonna do it in a way where it sees the pixels and the color change. So that's why our Photoshop's so magical, I guess, is because it has the ability to really see the pixels and know that um, it's a change in color or contrast so it can create that border and make that selection easy to do. Um, so there it is. So now we've got that flower fully selected. So let's go and check and see what's next, masking. So masking is kind of basically where we're at here. So, oh, is waiting. Oh, let's add this person here. Oh, I think um, we got her. <laughs> it's my friend Gazi. That's what's up. She's actually watching my thing. So. Basically, let's get back to that selection. So now we're gonna mask this off in a particular way. So there is a thing called channels in Photoshop. Um, I'm not gonna dig too deep into it, but this is a way to create a mask. Um, it allows you to separate out different things if you did need to layer things up. But a simple way to do it is actually just to create a layer. We have that selection from a little bit ago. And then now we're going to use one of the brushes and I'm gonna change the color so we can kinda of really just blatantly see what this is going to do here. And I'm just going to, so you see how that selection is holding the color back, I would say from the rest of the image. So for whatever reason, we need to select and keep this area contained. We can do that. And we've created a layer over here on the right that's gonna allow us to adjust it in more ways. So making masks is this matter of making a selection as we did in the very first part of this video and then going into a few different options. One is making a layer, another one would be making a channel, which if I wanted to, I could actually create an alpha channel, which is a, another selection piece. So I can come back to the selection pretty easy in the channel or the layer I could come back to it as well. Last thing, I guess, on the selections, we're going to always bounce back to that. There is a select, uh, what do you want to call it, menu here. So you basically can go into refine edge, which is another form of the selection. And it actually allows you to fine tune the edge of the actual selection. So if you wanted it to be a little bit softer or a certain amount of contrast between maybe layering it to the next thing, you could actually do that with under select, refine edge, and that's gonna be with any selection you do. So these are all actually part of the same thing. That's what I was talking about before when I meant we're gonna be kind of going in tandem with some of these tools. So the brush tool, we did use that a little bit. Let's talk about that a little more, and then let's talk about adjustment layers right after that. So if I jump back here to the program, and Knowing shortcut keys is good. It shows you the shortcuts for almost every last thing next to the um, particular tool in the menu. So if you just look at these things and you memorize some stuff, you'll actually, um, I would say you'll definitely get the hang of using it without pushing these buttons in the menu. You'll be able to simply just push Control D or whatever the case is. So Control D is deselect, so it allowed me to deselect the particular selection I had for the marigold. So if we look over here on the right and I click off of this little eyeball, it actually turns off the layer. So it gives me the ability to, well, 
turn off, I guess, the mask. I created a mask just from that layer, but if I needed to reselect, I could actually hold control, excuse me, hold control, and then it'll reselect that outline again. So, and that's coming from the information on this layer. So if I hold control and you look at the icon, it's like a finger with the selection looking box on the finger, meaning it's gonna grab the information off that layer and select it. So there's a cool way to select. It's kind of a shortcut in getting back into a selection if you ever needed to do so. Um, but then the brushes, let's get to those. So under the brush tool, this is the brush tool here. It looks like a brush or a paintbrush. So under that tool, basic tool that you're gonna use a lot, um, you could literally just draw on things with it. You could just start from a blank canvas and draw on things too. But you can also switch up how the brush works. So instead of it being a hard edge, it can be a soft edge. So I'm going into these tools here and these are now just the different types of brushes. So some of them are just different sizes but the, you can adjust the size manually up here or the hardness, which is kind of the difference between the hard edge or the soft edge or the soft looking strokes. But then there's some special brushes too that you can utilize. So there's a bunch of cool just default ones that are kind of like spray paint. Or also let's say, how do I adjust my brush size? Quick way on the keyboard is the brackets. So just below the backspace in most keyboards, there's the brackets. You can do the right bracket for to enlarge or the left bracket to make it a bit smaller. And then you can draw. And obviously this is getting a little bit messy because there's just one color on the screen here. So when you need to change colors, it's always just uh, clicking on the color you see down here, which is normally default black and white. But once you click on it, it opens up the palette or the color picker, and then you can go in and change colors. So in most cases, when you're doing stuff with the brush, you probably are doing this a lot, depending on what you're doing, what you're messing with. There's also an advanced menu on the brush that actually can allow for a lot of other things. So I'm not going to talk too deep into that, but just know that there's um, the basic menu is kind of up here. But then when you click on this little folder, which a bunch of brushes are on it, it says toggle the brush pane or panel. Um, and that's going to open up this panel over here, which gives you more options. So let's see here, where are we at? We're on adjustment layers next. So adjustment layers are pretty cool. And I'm gonna use this channel that I saved here to do that reselection. And under the layers, so just creating layers is gonna give you the ability to do adjustments or paint on top or whatever. But in this case, we're going to adjust the color of the marigold. So I already have it selected and I used the channel and the alpha channel here that I created before, and I held control, clicked on it, and it gave me that selection again. So now I can go down here, and I can click on one of the adjustments. So uh, it actually is this one here. So it's this half circle, or up here on the menu is another way you can get to it. There's a few ways you can get to the same things in Photoshop, but some of the main adjustments, brightness, contrast, levels, curves, exposure. Maybe some people have heard about that one and when you deal with cameras. Um, hue and saturation is the color. Like, so that's what we're gonna deal with. We're gonna click on that one. And now I can adjust. So the, the, the selection's still there even though we aren't seeing it. It's just because of the way it's been masked. But basically, it's now I can adjust only that flower into a different color range or saturation is like how vivid it is. So if I wanted to draw the color out of the flower, I could do that with the saturation or add a bunch of color back, make it hyper real looking or a lot of flowers are pretty uh, hyper real looking anyway. They're super vibrant in color, but you could dial it back to make it match your image better. So that is kind of one adjustment layer, but you could do a ton of different um, adjustments to a particular image, depending on what you're going for. In this case, this is kind of a simple basic thing that 
I would say when I got started using Photoshop to some of the things I was doing, trying to learn how I can make selections, how I can adjust the layers, um, how I can paint on top, create, control the, the particular selections in different ways. So the next piece here is the clone stamp. We've been talking about layers a bit, but the clone stamp is a pretty unique one. So let's jump back in and let's actually start from a different file. I'm gonna go in and find a, you know what? I talked about using this before this image. Let's use it now. So oh, this was that original Photoshop, um, Photoshop file, even though it wasn't really Photoshopped at the time, but we're about to Photoshop it. So we're gonna do a couple different things with the clone stamp. We're gonna add another mountain, maybe add some more clouds or take away some clouds, maybe even clone Jennifer, Jennifer in Paradise, that was the name of the file, but this, her name is Jennifer and according to the Photoshop story, but basically I can clone her too and add her over here on the left or something like that. So the clone stamp tool is located on this toolbar here and it is just past the brush. So if you click on it, and there's two different tools. We're just gonna talk about the clone stamp. Um, basically, it's going to copy pixels from this circle. So this circle is like a brush, but it's looking at the pixels that I'm hovering over. So once I hold, oh, it's Alt. Alt is going to tell it where to target out the pixels first, and then I'm gonna use those pixels like a brush over somewhere else. So now that I've, Held Alt, I left click, I can draw this mountain over somewhere else. So I drew it a little bit too high, but it's, that's okay. It's, it's gonna work, <laughs> as we can see. And it's a little messed up right here because it's like a transition. So we could fix that in a couple different ways. We can stamp somewhere else. We can stamp right in this area and then just click a few times to maybe blend it even though that's something like that who knows maybe it's cloudy over there you can add more clouds from up there down here or take these clouds and put them over the mountain a little bit for some reason they're super low <laughs> in the sky and then maybe we can move her over here too. So I could clone her from any point and then just start to draw her in like this. So she's got a clone. And obviously we're doing some kind of weird things here with the colors where they're not exactly where they need to be. But that's where you can continue to do some cloning make the brush smaller so brackets again or left and right brackets to resize the brush holding alt to resample and then i'm going in and cleaning up the image as best you can like and this is where it can take time <laughs> if you don't place it like i placed her up above from the last place and so now that that's happened i have to adjust a bunch of other things around it if i had have made it closer to the same level, then I wouldn't have had to maybe make so much adjustments because of the color variations in the image. So the clone stamp tool, pretty cool. You can do a lot with it. Like it's a pretty powerful tool. That particular one by itself can rework all kinds of things with images um, just, just by itself. So let's see here, clone stamp. Next, we talked about some layers. Let's talk about some blending modes really quick. So blending modes are pretty cool because you can layer things together in a certain way. Um, let's see, for example, let's say I'm gonna create some text. So there's text on this toolbar too, even though this isn't one of the main things to talk about. This is just a common thing that most design tools are gonna have. You're gonna be able to type some stuff in. So let's say we call this, um, Paradise. So this is how you would actually start to kind of create mm, a poster, uh, album cover, 
uh, kind of anything where you need to start throwing text in, you could start playing around with it as soon as you get the idea. So, so for example, let's say this is a ad of some form. And if I click on text and I, I go back to this, I can change the color of my text, highlight everything. And I'm gonna make this darker. Or you know what? I'll make it lighter and then I'll do a couple different things. So I could, for one, the blending modes are here on the layer. So the blending modes allow you to adjust how this particular layer blends with the next below it. And basically, or all the layers between, you know, and like, an, and it's always based on the stacking thing like that. So if I were to just go through some of these, we're going to see how to adjust that paradise text. It's using the layer below it to give variation or to blend the color in a certain way. So this linear burn, it kind of makes it fade to the back and kind of actually blends really nice in a certain way. And if we were just to adjust the size of this again, so what I'm doing right now is using the transformation tools to change the size of the elements, let's say I like that, since we're basically building up different layers, think about each layer as like an element to the picture. And we're just building things up right now, we're adding paradise into the image. And then, um, so let's add another blending mode or blending layer with, um, I don't know, maybe more text. I could say something else. Let's say it's an event and we want it to say, join us this particular day. We could go in and say, join. Sorry, I just needed to move it over so I can see what I'm doing because it got a little off the screen there. Join us. And if I ever wanted to change the size of the text, I could do that here up at the top as well and it'll resize things but I have to make sure I've selected everything and then I can resize which got really small for 12 point but we need something that's probably good 72 sounds fine looks fine so let's say join us and then you put some information in there the date the time whatever it is and this could be like a if you size it the right size, a five by six or four by three or some basic sizes like that, you can make this turn into um, a postcard or an invite type of situation pretty quick. Um, obviously, the way I Photoshop the two mountains and the person, the subject and that content matter, you would obviously be choosing that per what you're doing. Um, this was just a quick example, kind of what I was thinking about as we went through this. So... I guess here we're about halfway through. We're getting through almost all of these. So we'll have about 10 minutes or so for easily for the actual um, kind of like poster that I'm going to make, but it's similar to what we're doing now. So transformation tools, let's talk about those a little bit and then we'll talk about liquify and then the kind of last thing is crop. So transformation tools are going to come in when you need to once again, adjust the size. So before, when I clicked on this, right here at the top, we're on the main selection tool. So right here at the top, auto select by group or layer, and then you have show transformation controls. So the way that I have it set up right now, when I click on any particular piece of an element or of a layer, it will select it automatically. It'll give me the ability just to grab it and see that I've got it. If you turn any of this stuff off, it won't show that selection even if you're on it. Or if you want layers instead of groups, it'll only select the layers even if you had things over here on the right hand side grouped up. So you can group things up if you have a lot of little elements and you need to make them easier to manage. You can create groups at the bottom here. Um, so this is the layer panel um, and some of the features of it are creating groups, one of them is. But under the selection, it's talking about that setup. So group by default, 
doesn't really matter if you don't have groups, it'll just select the way it can. So other things you can do with the transformation tools. So if I click on, let's say the paradise here, and I click or go up to image, or excuse me, it's not image, it's actually under layer. Uh, I guess, it'll, oh, here it is. They've got it kind of in a weird spot. It's under edit. So in edit, under transform, this is the some of the transformation tools you can utilize as well. And it'll do precise movements for you. So if you need to rotate 180, it'll be a flip over in this particular way. It'll flip it upside down. Um, or if you need to do that, so back to edit, transform, quarter turns, full turns. There's also, sorry, I'm bouncing around so much trying to find, <laughs> these, these menu sets, are getting, they can be kind of deep, but ultimately it's under edit for transform. And then you can even scale. So you can scale it by percentages up here at the top. You can also, I guess, do it by an angle and skew it. So the height versus the vertical skew versus the horizontal skew. That's what these two numbers are. So if you want it to look more dynamic, I guess. <laughs> so let me reposition this on the screen. So if you ever need to zoom out like I'm doing right now, it's holding alt and using the middle mouse wheel. Otherwise you might have to go into the zoom over here and do it manually that way. But shortcut keys will save your life, alt, zoom out. So now that I'm this zoomed out, I can grab this top piece of the transformation tool. And then if I push the check mark at the top, it kind of verifies that particular adjustment, and then now I can rotate this. Maybe size it back up a little bit because I made it too small. There we go, something like that, I guess. But you can always go back and adjust things forever, indefinitely. You can always go back and adjust things. You can always retype out Paradise or whatever the words need to actually be and um, kind of make adjustments. So the transformation tools, you can use them to adjust, I guess, the, the sizes, the rotation, those types of things. Think about it as that type of tool. All right, so liquify this one's a cool one let's use a new image let's try out hmm. this one's already a photoshopped image but let's see how big it is hmm. it's not too small so we could use liquify to even adjust how watery this looks and use it in these areas so liquify is a filter and if you click on filter, there's a bunch of filters for Photoshop to create blur, to do all kinds of different effects. I would say this is probably like the effect area of this program. If you know other programs that have effects, this would be it for Photoshop, this particular list of them. Um, I'm sure in the newer Photoshops, they're gonna have some newer versions of these things, but Liquify probably holds pretty tried and true, I would say on the way it's gonna work. So when you click on it, it may take a second for it to load, but once it does, um, it's kind of like, not necessarily a separate program, but it's kind of like a mini thing. And I actually have to drag it on the screen for us to see. <laughs> there it is. It popped up on one of my other screens. All right, so this is the Liquify tool. And like I said, it's kind of, it's not a separate thing from Photoshop, but it seems to be contained in its own way. It took a second for it to load up on my computer. So when I'm in it, it actually has its own little interface that allows you to do some different things. It has brushes, it has um, controls for the brushes. Um, on this left-hand side here, it has a few different types of liquefying tools. So bloat actually makes things bloat, makes them bigger. 
well, let's say one of the, <laughs> for whatever reason, make this guy look a little bigger than what he was. Even though it looks kind of distorted down where his stomach is, I think we saw what that just did. Or for example, if I wanted to do the twist, I could make the water almost do some crazy things or make the world look really distorted in the background. And you can adjust how hard it twists and some of the different things per, per, per brush. So always go in and play with as much stuff as you can when you're learning new programs so you can kind of get the idea of how you might utilize it when you're doing something for real. So maybe I can change how the shark looks a little bit in the inside where he's got a more of a pointy face or I can tighten up and adjust the, so this is actually even moving the pixels around just enough to where you can even adjust the actual face of the dolphin or like different things. There's no telling how you could utilize this particular tool for um, your purposes or how I'm moving in the, the shore or bringing it out more. And if I make the brush size smaller, I can make tighter detailed adjustments. So I think we can all see kind of where that's going when it comes to the liquify tool. It actually gives you quite a bit of control over moving some pixels around and not really messing the image up too much um, when it comes to making it look n not accurate to what maybe what you were going for, if that makes sense. Like some tools outside of this can really blow out the pixels or distort them in a way where they don't look good versus that tool keeps things looking good. Um, last tool is the crop tool. So we're getting close to the end here, but this is going to be the last tool and then we're going to make a quick, I'm just going to show a quick demo of how I make a poster, how we save it, how we export. So crop is on this list too. And it's actually just past the selection. It kind of is this weird shape. <laughs> I really can't even explain what it looks like. But what it does, most people know what cropping is, but if you don't, it basically is a way to reduce the size of an image by taking away some of the, some of the image. So it's almost like if you had scissors, cut off the sides and you leave just this particular part. Um, cropping can allow you to format the image to make it work better for a particular frame. Let's say you were trying to put so up here at the top, you're trying. let's say you're trying to put a picture in a frame that was not the right shape. Like you took a picture, but you needed it to fit in a certain aspect ratio or certain dimensions. Um, this is how you could adjust that. So when you're under crop, and if you click on this little drop down, there's some preset crop options. So let's say you had a picture that you needed it to be eight by 10, which is like the medium, I guess one of the bigger types sizes of pictures that you can get printed at somewhere like Walgreens or CVS or something like that. So, or Staples, I guess, who knows? Who knows where you go to get your stuff printed these days? But they're going to ask for usually particular sizes. Um, and this size is set up for 8 by 10. So if I zoom out, now that I've cropped it, now we've got the main, let's say, subjects of the picture here. We've got the dolphin, and then we've got the guy. And I actually canceled the liquify um, things that I did, so obviously we don't see those adjustments of the guy looking bigger and the dolphin's face moved around and all that stuff. But just know that um, if I had pushed OK, we would have saw that too. But this was really just adjusting the shape of the picture. So cropping is adjusting the shape. Um, and there are some options on how you can lock the width and the height, lock the proportions in. So by clicking down, clicking on one of the options, you can do that, but you can also manually add those things in. So if we did want to crop, let's say this image to like a five by three, it's going to lock that in. And then we would just click the check box here at the top or the check mark here at the top. And then it's going to crop the image and it's going to crop it down to the size that 
you were expecting it to be. <laughs> so it's now five inches across by three inches tall. Um, and we can see that on the bar here, there's always rulers here you can measure with, and you can always switch the rulers to be different, um, different dimensions, different way of, of looking at it. So whether it's pixels, whether it's centimeters and all these other different things. All right, so let's actually start anew. We've got, looks like about 10, 12-ish minutes left, but we'll make this in about five or six, and then we'll just do a QA and a at the end, and uh, yeah, we'll be pretty much wrapping it up very quickly here. So let's start new, and with, when you click on new from the file menu, you get this panel here, it's kind of like a setup dialog. It gives you the ability to set up the image that you're going for. So there are some presets, so like US paper, and then under the sizes you have letter, legal, tabloid. Tabloid's like a poster. Usually this is the poster size that you see when you print off the eight and a half by 11, like two pieces of paper together is eight and a half by 11. So let's create that. So now it's this long looking, type of uh, blank document. So on the right hand side here, here's our layer. The background is a locked, usually a locked layer. Um, you can always change that if you need to, but it basically just gives you the bottom, I would say, of your document. You stack everything on top of the background in most cases. You could even delete that if you don't need it. But what I'm gonna do is bring this image in so I'll bring that Seattle image in that we kind of saw before. And I'm gonna zoom, not zoom in, but make it larger with the transformation tools. So the stuff we learned about before. And I'm gonna move it down and then I'm gonna pop it right there. So the next thing I'm gonna do is just add some text and I'm gonna blend this, this, edge right here. So I'm going to use a selection to do so. So I'm going to grab this rectangular marquee tool, drag a mm, kind of evenly spaced, I would say, um, selection around this area on the image. And now we're, this is a selection on that image. So now what I can do, first thing I have to do, this is a thing I didn't talk about, but we have to rasterize the layer because when you bring in images, it creates a smart object or some type of smart layer that um, can be adjusted and it'll adjust for the resolution changes and size and all this different cool stuff. Photoshop's pretty powerful when it comes to being able to keep things not looking pixelated, even if you blow them up. But we want to make sure that it just leaves it like it is at this point and keeps it rasterized, which is meaning just no special features, just the pixels. So now with the selection, I can refine the edge and I can feather it, smooth it a little bit. And now if I push delete, it's actually going to kind of create like a blend on that edge. So this is just from creating selection, refining the edge, making sure that whatever I'm trying to blend like this is a rastered image. So it doesn't have the ability to um, be adjusted anymore. So now that we've got that down, let's say, let's add some text. Um, I'm just gonna just say Seattle. And Still using that same font. Um, it does not matter if, I mean, you can use the same font for everything if you want. But if I ever wanted to adjust my font, I'm gonna do that really quick just to show the example. If I push T for text, click on my text, I'm gonna select everything. And then up here, here's my fonts. I have a bunch on my computer. You can get a lot of free fonts from 1001fonts.com. All right. Here we go, y'all. Seattle House Party. 
But let me change that font size first, just so everything's not all super crazy big. And then let's add one more text element here. I'm going to say So what I'm doing is just adding just a different element to this particular thing. So let's say it was a time and address and all that stuff. So now I'm going to use this one and add an adjustment layer. So we're going through all the different things that basically we went through in this hour. And at the end of it here, I'm just using them all um, respectively. <laughs> so let's say I liked how that looked. I can change the opacity and make it a little bit more faint or the fill, which is kind of like the opacity, but it's a bit different. It's kind of hard to explain, but it is basically uh, how much of it's there versus how see-through it is. It's a, little, it's a little bit different. So let's say I want that up there and now I'm gonna adjust the house party size again but I don't want to do it with the font I'm gonna, or with the text. I'm just going to resize it manually and make it bigger with the transformation tools. And I can even use the arrow keys to adjust the, the fine tuning of the, the placement of this as well. Awesome. So let's say that's my poster. I want to save this thing. So if I click on file, down here, we got save, save as. So if I click on save as, just by default, it's gonna save in the format of a Photoshop file. So you can go back in, you can make adjustments. So let's do that. Let's just save it as Seattle House Party. Or just Seattle Party or whatever. Whatever you need to call it. It'll save the layers. This little other thing will pop up. Talking about compatibility. Maybe it doesn't do that in new ones. It did it in this old one. But now we have a Photoshop file that we can go back to. But if I were to want an image, I would say save as and click format and drop down. And there's now a bunch of different formats. JPEG is the most basic, but I would say um, you can save it into any of these different formats depending on if you know what to do with them or where they go, uh, where you use them. But JPEG is what you want if let's say you wanna just print this thing out. So, I'll save it to wherever I need to, my desktop. A couple options will pop up here right at the end. Um, you're just saving basically the, the, the options for that particular file type and just click OK. And then it'll be an image now that's on your desktop. So if I were to find this on my desktop here, here it is. And I can click on that. And then here's the image in the preview of the photo app or whatever on the computer. But it's basically, that's basically how you would do it. And then you would take that file to wherever they, a printer exists, Minuteman Press, Fast Signs, Walgreens, all the different places. And you would go and you would print your stuff and you would make it, make it live and, and live in color in like real tangible form. And yeah, I guess that's kind of the main meat of like what you can do in Photoshop. And then the better you get at it, the more crazy stuff you can make. Um, like I guess in the grand scheme of things. Alrighty, so I'm gonna take some questions here right at the end, if there are any. If any, anybody wants to talk, anybody wanted to look at my website or anything like oh, nice. that. Pretty much have and also main thing is really just knowing how to search 3d printing stuff this is uh, another yeah. website that i have too so both of them are on the screen there with their urls and then if you did have any questions you can email me as well about things and i can send links and all kind of that stuff to people as well samson with hair little thing is uh yeah just a big thank you so thank you for watching and following along with me in Photoshop and look forward to some different classes I'll have in the future. And that's it.